Thank you for allowing us to come here safely. And for the ones that are on their way, Father, you just protect them on the road. On the road. And you just be with every single one of our hearts, Father, that our minds and our hearts are just open up to your presence and your love this morning. And we just praise you with a full, loving heart. We love you, and in Jesus' name, amen. You are good and your mercy enduring forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy enduring forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you. Worship you for who you are. We worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you for who you are. You are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you for who you are. We worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you for who you are. You are good. Woo! Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yeah. You are good all the time, all the time. You are good, you are good all the time, all the time. You are good, you are good all the time, all the time. You are good, you are good all the time, all the time. You are good. Good and your mercy endure it forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure it forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you. Worship you for who you are. We worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you for who you are. For who you are. For who you are. Amen, because he is good in this place. Water you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you There's none like you Our God is greater, our 
our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. all of your heart. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, Awesome in power, our God, our God. Father, we just continue to just worship you. Just continue to lift your name. Father, because we believe in your love, and I know we need our, your love. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over. have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have 
been so, so shadow you won't light up 
Mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Come on, y'all sing it. No Atmospheres change now for the spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the spirit of Fear is changing now for the spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the spirit of Overflow in this place, fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love. Your love, your love. 
Just talk to him. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. A miracle can happen now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. Spirit of God fall fresh on us we need your presence come on let's just believe that your kingdom come your will be done here as in heaven spirit of God for fresh on us, we need your presence. Your kingdom come, your will be done here as in heaven. Isn't he amazing? Isn't his love just amazing? The way that he just surrounds us with protection and healing. Just the way that he just loves us and just wraps us in his arms. Father, that you are so good in this place. You are so good in our lives, God. Father, that your spirit just overcome us this whole week, Father with everything that we'll come through, everything that we'll go through, Father. You just be with us right by our side, God. Sing the chorus one more time, Overflow. Overflow in this place, fill our hearts with your love. To encounter your love, your love surrounds us. Come on, let's give him a round of applause in this place. 
And you may be seated. Hey, man, good morning. So, um, be in prayer for David Ochoa, the Salter's family. His, um, his brother-in-law passed away this morning. That's why he's not here. Um, he'd been sick for a little while, been struggling for some time now, and um, they put him on hospice last week, and um, he went to be with the Lord this morning. So, um, as tough as it is to experience that from a loved one, I'm sure many of you have experienced that. There's a, there's a, there's a peace that kind of holds you from falling into the darkness of mourning pit, you know, of knowing that, is, that he's saved and we'll get to see him again one day. So what I want to do this morning is I'm going to go over a couple of announcements because um, for me, I, I think that many of you on your journey, you know, walking with the Lord, uh, some of you are okay doing it on your own. <laughs> Some of you are okay kind of making it on your own, you know, being independent. But for a lot of us, we need, we need each other and we need the fellowship and we need the building up of each other. And so, you know, we make those opportunities available so that you can be a part of the family and feel a part of the Christian prayer or Christian, um, the Christian family. Our number one ministry that we'd love to introduce people to if you're not a part of anything is our monday night prayer group our monday night prayer group is probably the most faithful group we've had um for over 10 years now and uh faithfully these guys have been um praying for the needs that um that you fill out and put on here let me tell you they take the prayers that are on here they write them in a book and they open them up every week and they go through the prayers and they read them. And then when a prayer is answered and they hear about it, they go in there and, you know, put Jesus over it. Because Jesus, you know, answers prayers. And so they're very faithful. They're very committed. And uh, it's a good place to start. Um, they have a little dinner before. It's a couple hours long. They have a little dinner, a little fellowship. And then they pray for a little while. And uh, it's just a great place to meet new people. Matter of fact, a lot of our uh, family who've moved out, who've moved here from out of town and are joining our church, kind of connect with them at the prayer group, Dave and Jeannie's house. Uh, once a month, they move it to one of the other people's house. So if you'd like to be a part of that, um, we don't really just throw their address out there uh, <laughs> because not everybody comes here saved. <laughs> we do have criminals that come here sometimes. <laughs> We try to get them saved, but you never know. And so if you want to be a part of that, just contact the office. We'll give you the address, and you can go and be a part of that. Um, we also are going to start our men's Bible study back up on Tuesday. Um, and we have two of them available, one in the morning at 8 o'clock or 8.30 here at the church, for those of you that can be here at 8.30 in the morning. And then at Tuesday night at 6 o'clock. Great Bible study, great Bible study. Brother Jim, he's kind of patrolling the perimeters right now. He's kind of overseeing that. And we have, uh, I think there's about 12 to 15 men come on Tuesday morning. I'm not sure how many come in the evening, but what a great opportunity to grow together, to be able to fellowship together and just be a part of what God is doing in our body. And if you have your bullets and just look through it and see what else is available. And also, there's a great devotion over last week's teaching every week. Uh, I'm not the one doing it. Somebody else is doing it. We have an anonymous writer that, that um, takes what's said and see how it can apply to their life and then just kind of sh speaks to how they heard what God was speaking. And so I think it maybe encourage you as well to, to also, you know, think about some of the questions that she'll ask you. Um, so I did give the gender away. <laughs> yes, ma'am. The baby boomers, you mean by old people? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I fall right underneath baby boomers. I'm just playing. Yeah, that's a great group. Um, and you know, this morning we're in the book of James. So if you got your Bibles, turn to the book of James. We're not going to get very far today because we're in chapter 4. Uh, we went over the first part of chapter 4. Last week, uh, 
And while you're turning there, let me mention this. That also on Wednesday nights, you know, we're, we're journeying through the Old Testament. And we just started the book of Joshua um, this past Wednesday. And so we would encourage you to come be a part of that. We also do the potluck and the fellowship. And um, how about them Dallas Cowboys, though? <laughs> Now, I know not everybody's a Dallas Cowboy fan, but I'm going to be a little racist for just a second. I don't know how you can be Mexican from Texas and not be a Cowboys fan. But we have one, we have one girl. She's right there in the sound booth. There's a Seattle fan. And you can, you can see her in the middle all by herself last night. Put that picture back up. You see her, and we're all pointing at her. So, you know, we're going to talk about Christian fellowship and brotherly love this morning. And what a great song that we sang um, this morning about love and God's love for us. Because when we studied the book of James, James is, it, look, look, James is the brother of Jesus. He didn't even become a Christian until after the resurrection. But after the resurrection, when Jesus showed up and said, hey, brother, it changed him. It changed him because the Jewish people were always looking for a Messiah And so I can imagine it was hard for James to think that his older brother was the actual Messiah, the creator of the universe, the son of God. And it took Jesus' resurrection to get his attention. But you know what? God was so faithful and gracious that he gave him just what he needed. He gave him what he needed to get him on track. And then James, he's not one of the 12 apostles. He's not mentioning that, but he's definitely a leader in the body. And and some of the research that I've done and reading about James is he was very Jewish. He loved his Jewish culture. He loved his Jewish nature so much that when he went to go visit uh, Paul and Peter in Galatia, I believe, when he showed up, Peter jumped back and got away from the Gentiles because he didn't want James to think that he was fellowshipping with Gentiles, even though the gospel was for the Gentiles. There was something religious about James that just portrayed, and even James um, talks about in the book of Acts, um, the Nazarite vow, and these men doing the Nazarite vow, which is a Jewish custom, which is Old Testament. And so he was really into that, but once he got saved, he, he didn't play. When you read the book of James, he's, he's in your face with some things. He comes at you and says, well, you know, in the, in the first part of chapter 4, he says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that warn your members? So he's telling us the truth. We studied that last week, and there's a lot of truth in that. And you go back and read the first four chapters, and you'll see that James is coming right at us. He's just coming right at us. But listen, remember... God is very gracious with you and your walk right where you're at. Just because your walk may be a very Jewish walk, you got to be careful expecting him to have a very Jewish walk at the same time. Because when you keep reading down and you get to verse uh, 11, is what we're going to pick up this morning. In verse 11, it says this, Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver, or only one lawgiver, who is able to save and destroy Who are you to judge another? Now, that word evil just means speaking negative about somebody. Just speaking negative about somebody. And that word judge just means trying to pick and figure out somebody's character or motives. Trying to figure out, well, this is why they do that. They're this kind of person. Or they're doing this. Or they're not here because of that. We have to be careful saying anything about anybody. What, I had, what I've had to learn is when people leave the church, and they do, people see something they don't agree with or something said to them or they get a disagreement with somebody else or whatever, and they leave the church and go to another church. Yeah, it's sad sometimes to see that and to experience that. But I don't want to go, well, they, there it is, and just mumble about them. 
I just go, Lord, please keep them in your hands. Just, Lord, and, and I've told a few people, look, it doesn't matter whether you're here or there. Just stay with him. That's all that matters. You don't have to stay with me. I'm not the best. I'm not the most wonderful or the awesome pastor, pastor that I want to be. I know I have a lot of faults and failures, but i got to give grace to those to decide that maybe a better place is better for them, for their journey, for their chapter. Because we all go through chapters. I've left a church before, before I became a pastor. Some of you left churches and came over here. And so we just want to be careful how we put on somebody a reason why they left or talk about them because they left. Even if they don't want to come and fellowship with us. Oh, they think they're better than us. They want to go over there and all they want to do, they don't want to come party over here at the church with us because we don't have beer. They want to go do beer. They want to do all. We got to be careful judging people like that. We can't put that on people. This is what, look, behold, this is the Old Testament. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Because imagine, well, I don't do church like the Baptists. The Baptists don't do church like the Pentecostals. The Pentecostals don't do church like the Methodists. The Methodists don't do church like the Church of Christ. Church of Christ don't do church like these guys and these guys and these guys. We got to be careful judging how they do church. Because it tells us that every man will stand before the Lord by himself with the Lord next to him. My dad reminds me of that when I say, I'm going to stand before the Lord by myself. He goes, no, no, Jesus is going to be there with you. Jesus is going to be with all the Church of Christ, the Methodists, the Episcopalians, whatever. He's going to be right there with them. If he is their Lord, they may walk a different path than I walk, but they're his. I have to be careful to judge another church and judge another person's ways of doing things because I don't know. And we're going to see for ourselves that Paul tells us that I've got a ton of scriptures to back up what I'm saying. Because in the end, we're brothers and sisters. We're a brotherhood. With sisters in it. I mean, it's called brotherhood, but we know that you're included like mankind. There's women in mankind. I know we all came from women. Women are powerful. Women are smarter. Women are wiser. Let me go ahead and get that out of the way. <laughs> because Proverbs said that wisdom is referred to as a woman. She, you know, wisdom is like her. She is... She, uh, Watch it now. <laughs> but look, this is what he says. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the, on the beard, the beard of Aaron. Now, if you can imagine, the most holy moment of all is when they take the oil and they anoint uh, Aaron to be the priest that's going to represent and be God's voice to everybody. And that oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit coming upon Aaron so that Aaron could walk that walk out. And so it's a, it's a precious anointing. It's a precious thing. And so he's saying, if we can dwell together in unity, together in unity, if we can find a commonality, not in the way we walk our walk, but in Jesus Christ being our Lord and Savior. As long as we believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior and that by his death we are redeemed, man, that makes us kin folks. There are Catholics that go to Catholic church that believe Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. There are Catholics that believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. I'm not going to do church like the Catholics do church because... I don't have a piece about it, and I don't think that that's what God's called me to do or how I'm supposed to do it, but I'm going to be very careful how I talk about my Catholic brothers. We have Kairos back here, and by the way, Kairos um, goes into the prisons. We're going to be going here in uh, February the 14th, and uh, we take 40, 44 guys, 42 guys, 42 prisoners, and... Um, we, we spend four days, all day, like 10, 11, 12 hours a day with these guys doing different, uh, what do you call, just Talk. talks and just little, not rituals, but they're kind of like rituals, but, but they're really powerful. Because even when I went in, I was judging them. I was going, 
man, this is kind of weird. This is cultish. But once I did, I went, oh, man, these guys are, and there were different backgrounds, Church of Christ, Catholic, me, <laughs> Jeff, ex-cons, David, you know what I mean? All, Johnny, all of us doing this. And so I love the prison ministry. That's why we go every Tuesday. That's why we um, do what we do with the prisons. And so one of the things that they do is they feed these guys like they're on the outside. They get to eat hamburgers, fried chicken, barbecue, cookies till they're coming out their ears. And you, it's sad when you watch these guys, they got plenty of hamburgers for all of them. And them guys will make five patty long hamburgers. <laughs> because they think they don't get no more. But $5 a ticket helps pay for a meal for one of those guys. And so if, and plus we have a prayer chain. All you do is just write your name on there and uh, your first name and date to tell you on there. And then we link, we cut them up, we link them together, we make a chain. And the one part of the ceremony, these guys walk in with this chain and it just starts going around the room. And they're from all over the world. And these guys say, man, there's somebody praying for this particular Kairos ministry weekend. And there are a thousand of them. The guys are overwhelmed when they see these chains come in. So we love to go to our brothers in prison because who are we to judge them? we already seen that God will tear down lies. He will break down walls, whatever he's got to do to get his love to you. My brother's in prison, and Jesus is loving on him in prison. But here's what makes the heart of the Lord smile. For brethren to dwell together in unity. In Romans 14, we have an interesting subject matter. And this subject matter that we're going to look at is dividing people. It's causing people to judge each other. And so Paul is going to address this situation. I thought it would be really good for us to walk through this situation, see how Paul talks about the division, the different ways of seeing how Christianity's walked out. Because so you remember, when, when he's writing this, Gentiles who have always been ungodly are now asked to be godly are now asked to come into the kingdom. So when they come into the kingdom, just like us, we still have parts of our background that, that we still, you know, are part of, like football, like the Dallas Cowboys. When, when, the, when, when, when I first got saved, the Dallas Cowboys were going to the Super Bowl the first year I got saved. The church I was going to knew that the Super Bowl was at 6 o'clock on a Sunday night. <laughs> Sunday night service started at 6.30 on Sunday night. And I was like this. What do I do? Because from the pulpit, they made a couple of comments about Jesus, <laughs> the Super Bowl. Which one are you choosing? And I was like, why do I got to choose? Why am I choosing? Wait a minute. I'm not choosing one or the other, but I want to see the Cowboys, but they, they, they begin to put this little pressure on me, and I felt convicted because I didn't, I, 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 was, I wasn't convicted, I was mad convicted, <laughs> because I loved Jesus with all my heart, I had just gotten saved, and he was everything to me, and I was, I gave up everything for him, I mean everything for him, and I didn't think he was, in, you're going to make me give up, the, I'm the Dallas Cowboys, you're going to the Super Bowl, man, for the first time in a long time, and I'm going to miss it? I went to church like this. <laughs> I got to church, wasn't nobody there. Wasn't nobody there. I was one of the only ones there. I was, I was the only one they got. And I just remember going, Lord, if you'll just give me one more Super Bowl. Next year, they went to the Super Bowl again, went to the game. Well, I went and watched the game that night. No conviction. No problem, because you know what? Jesus knew I loved him. Who are they to judge me because I wanted to do something that was a part of who I was? Look, Jesus is Lord no matter what about the Dallas Cowboys. I love Jesus way, way more than I love my wife, than I love my kids. What do you think the Cowboys are at on that list? <laughs> Just so you know, I love the Lord with all my heart love him. He has been so, so good to me. 
over all these 20-something years. I have failed him, but he has never failed me. I love him with all my heart, and I love his people with all my heart. But let's look at this situation. Receive one who is weak in the faith. Wait a minute. So there can be people that are Christian that are weak in their faith. But not to dispute over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things. Because you know Jewish people, they don't eat pork, they don't eat shellfish, certain foods they stay away from, clean and unclean. For one believes he may eat all things. That would be me. (laughs) Except broccoli. (laughs) But he who is weak eats only vegetables. All vegetarians are weak, apparently. (laughs) I'm just playing. I'm just playing. You got to be really strong to be a vegan or a vegetarian to to go by go meat, just so you know. You're stronger than I am. I'm the weak one. But it says this, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who? Both of them. The one who eats, the one who doesn't eat. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master. To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand for God is able to make him stand. You can't judge me if I don't walk my walk like you. And I cannot judge you if you walk your walk a little different than my walk. You may be an every service type person, and you may not be an every service type person. I will not judge you. I will tell you this, though, that sometimes you get judged on your own. Your choices and your walk will teach you the lessons you need to learn. The life that you walk will teach you the lessons you need to learn. I don't need to be the one saying, hey, watch out. You'll learn yourself. God will teach you. Amen? Amen? Amen. Because, I mean, that's a real deal. One person, then he changed the subject. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day, to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat and gives God thanks. Last night we had pork, and I said, thank you for this pork. (laughs) Seventh-day Adventists think we got it wrong. Seventh-day Adventists say we should go to church on Saturday. If that's God's holy day. But what is the word telling us right here? One person esteems one day above another. Right? Is that what he says? Is he telling us just exactly that, kind of breaking down that, that misconception that some people may have? But look, if they say that Saturday's the Sabbath and that's the day they want to go to church, it's not going to keep them out of heaven. But just because I choose to go on Sunday because that's just the tradition I grew up in and that's just the day that we've all chosen to come and do what we do, we choose Wednesday twos. I mean, as well. I'm, I'm, I'm cleaning my language up. I'm, <laughs> see, when you don't go to college, that's what happens. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. He's not finished. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. 
and every tongue shall confess. So then each of us, each of us individually, each of us shall give an account of himself, not what I thought you were doing or what you thought I was doing or this or that, but each of us will give an account of myself. Albert, tell me about Jeff. That ain't going to happen. Albert, let's talk about you and what you did, how you treated people. What, what day did you choose a day? Did you not choose a day? What about you? Where was your heart at in all that your decisions you were making? That's what he's talking about. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this. Not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. If somebody comes to you, when I got saved, I remember I'd get these letters when I was a part of the other ministry that said Reverend Albert Fuentes on them. My mailman saw it, and he goes, oh, you're a reverend. I go, well, I'm not really. I just paid these dues, and they just threw that title on there for these dues and whatever. And He said, well, hey, uh, you, you want to see something pretty neat? And I went, yeah, show me something neat. Go get your Bible. I went and got my Bible. This is my mailman. Got my Bible, opened it up. And he said, you shall be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. How was you baptized? How were you baptized? I go, well, I think he said, by the profession of your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's how I was baptized. He said, well, you're not saved then. I went, wait a minute. Are you saying that because the preacher didn't say what you just said when I went underwater and came out, I'm not saved? He said, no, this because it says you shall be saved. I went, holy cow. I got on the phone. I called my pastor. I go, hey, this guy, my mailman said I ain't saved, man. <laughs> he just delivered some terrible news to me. <laughs> <laughs> he called me in. We sat down. He walked me through these scriptures, and I went, oh, whew, I thought I was saved. I've been loving Jesus for all these months and all this whole year, these two years, thinking I was saved. He goes, you know, there's just, it, but this guy was judging me. He was judging me and he put a stumbling block between me and the Lord because it made me doubt for a second it made me confused Jesus saved my heart the day he saved me he saved me completely I didn't need a baptism to be saved I was baptized but I did not need baptism to save me I needed to understand that I was a sinner I needed to understand that I needed a Savior, that there was a God, and Jesus was my answer. Thank you, Lord. So don't put a stumbling block or cause to fall in your brother's way. So if somebody says, hey, you know, uh, I don't eat meat. Oh, well, let me show you the scriptures. Let me teach you how you can eat meat. See, now you're going to cause somebody to stumble in their faith. That's not what we're to do. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean itself. So he's kind of straightening out the true doctrine of that in a letter, but he's not in somebody's face doing it. But to him, and he says, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Notice that. To him, not you, to him it is unclean. Yet, if your brothers grieve because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. See, he's saying, well, don't force meat. Don't invite them over to eat meat. Just eat meat in the privacy of your home. Don't tell nobody. Don't say, hey, I'm a meat eater around a bunch of non-meat eaters. Because now you're going to cause them to stumble. Keep some of that to yourself. Even Paul says in 1 Corinthians, you guys are coming together and you're getting drunk. And you're being greedy with your food. He said, don't you have houses to drink in? What do you think he's talking about? What do, you, what do you think he said when he said that? Exactly what you probably think he said. The privacy of your home, and do it over there. Between you and God. It's not a stumbling block for you. It's not tearing your family up. It's not putting you in debt. Who am I to tell you it's wrong? If your wife's leaving you because you're doing it, you're broke because you're doing it, hey, I don't have to tell you there's something wrong there. You and the Lord got that figured out. Don't you think? You should be a little smarter now. I mean, we're not stupid people here, although we make stupid choices sometimes. <laughs> do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. 
For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Beautiful. Therefore, let us pursue, chase after, go after, sell everything, just, just go after it. Let us pursue the things which make for peace, forgiveness, patience, long-suffering. Those things are a part of pursuing peace. The things by which one may edify each other, build each other up. Your, our job is to build each other up, not tear each other down. Not, I'm not going to point out all your faults. I'm going to point out all your gifts. I'm going to focus on your good stuff. I'm going to focus on what's good inside of you and feed into that. I'm not going to go beat you up for some of the things that you already know are hurting you and holding you back. Edify. The things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things are indeed pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Let that soak in. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is, it, is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. If you're going home doing what you know you shouldn't be doing because you think you got the freedom and you're feeling guilty about it, it's a sin. It's a sin. He's telling us. If your conscience is telling you, well, Albert said I could drink at home. That's not what I said. <laughs> I did not say that. What I said was, between you and God, what you do, some of those things. We already know adultery is wrong, left or right. Thieving is wrong. Murder is wrong. We know those things. But there's some things that get, people get tangled up in that, God, that Paul and the Holy Spirit just wants us to clarify some of these things. Because we all have our different journeys. We all come from different backgrounds. Right? You may be a recovering Wino. But this family over here grew up giving wine even to the kids at the dinner table. So you're going to condemn them because they've done it part of their custom the whole time? See how that can play out? We just, we just need Holy Spirit guidance and wisdom. Pray all these things through. Pray all these things through. So if you've said, I don't drink, but now Albert said I can drink. Let me tell you something. You're going to be in sin because your heart and mind is going to tell you it was already a sin. Don't do it. Happy is he who does not condemn himself. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts, see this is the part I'm telling you about, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. It makes sense. I mean, look, we know that this is, can be very complicated. We know it can be very complicated. I heard that the, that the scriptures can be as deep as the deepest oceans. But for some of us, it's as shallow for a two-year-old kid to get what he needs to get out of it. God will give us each his word to us so that we can walk our walk out. You may be gifted and being able to study the scriptures and take it into the depths that nobody else can figure out what you're talking about and still you're right but for some of us we just go Jesus loves me this I know for the but just keep it simple let me tell you something it's your walk with the Lord it's your walk with the Lord Ephesians 4 let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away. That's just negative speaking about people. From you with all malice. I, I appreciate him saying that with all malice because sometimes people can just be mean. They can just be spiteful. Make things hard for you. One teacher may not like another teacher, so she breaks all the pencil lids. 
before the teacher comes in there, make her sharpen them all. That's malice. Simple things like that just irritate somebody. <laughs> just little things can, can be malice. You know, if you go to somebody's restroom and you turn their toilet paper around. I was like, because I do stuff like that to Patricia, but I'm not doing that out of malice. I'm just doing it to just see what I can get out of her sometimes. Just to see, <laughs> see if she gets that stuff. That's just, that's just uh, flirting. <laughs> I, call that, I call that flirting. <laughs> we call that flirting. And be kind to one another. Look, and be kind to one another. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as Christ forgave you. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak the truth to, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all. Ma- oh, I got that one. Colossians 3. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. How many of you have these as part of your characteristic? This needs to be part of who we are as believers. I'm not finger-pointing, but these are the characteristics of Christ. The woman at the well, he was very tender-hearted with her. He was very kind to her. He was very loving to her. The woman caught in adultery... He's very kind to her, very loving to her. The woman who who has been over for all those years, he's very kind and loving. The woman with the issue of blood, he's very kind and loving to these people. Why is it so hard for us to want to just go around and and feel like we got to be everybody's professor, everybody's captain? Look, God wants us to be fellow soldiers. Fellow soldiers, fellow soldiers, one with another, walking this out together, hand in hand. You see a weakness in me, don't come point it out. Pray for me first. And then come alongside and see how you can make me stronger where I'm weak. And just show me some love. You show me some love, I'm all ears. You come at me with a finger, I want to break it. You know what I mean? (laughs) Because people have come at me over the years with fingers, and I've even had to take that kindly. I had to sit in front of people. I remember sitting in front of a guy, and he was just wearing, he was whooping me. Now, it was my wife that was ready to jump up and snap a finger. <laughs> I was taking it. I was taking it. And, and I could tell I needed to get her out of there because she wanted to defend her husband as I was sitting there just eating it. And uh, I appreciate that for my wife because you're supposed to defend each other. You know what I mean? So there was, it just was me that would have been wrong. So I received it. Bearing with one another. You know what bearing with one another means? It means helping somebody up. Holding somebody up. Helping keep somebody up. That's what bearing one another means. It means if you see somebody that's weak or struggling, you don't just go, yep, that's why I don't follow him. That's why I don't want to be in his life. Because I see a weakness and going down. No, oh, man. Come alongside of each other and help each other in our, in our weaknesses. That's, that's Christ-like. That's what Christ did. The only people that he showed any anger towards were those who thought they knew it all. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the ones that were using their, their position to control people, to rob people, to fleece people. But to the rest of the world, to the rest of them, the thief on the cross started out mocking him. Started out on the cross mocking Jesus. But by the end... He could tell his life was beginning to slip away, and he knew that the Spirit was coming. And he could hear what Jesus was saying. He listened. He heard Jesus saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. James, they said that when he was walking, preaching, the Pharisees hated him. Hated him. One of the stories said that uh, they wanted him to go to the temple and speak to all the people, Climb up the temple and speak to all the people and tell them that the, the, the Jewish way was the way, not Jesus. He got up there and started preaching Jesus, they said. 
So they pushed him off the temple, and he fell. He didn't die. But when he got down there, people were clubbing him to death. And while they were clubbing him to death, it said that he said, Father, forgive him. Stephen also, when he was being stoned, said the same thing. Listen, we're Christians. If we get a martyr's death, that's the highest death you can have. A martyr's death is dying for Christ's sake because of your walk with Christ. What he's asking from us is to put aside what makes us human, natural humans, the unkindness, the anger, the wrath. That's, that comes natural for people, probably for a lot of us. But what he's asking from us is to put on the characteristics of Christ. And it is a battle to do that. But if you walk in the Spirit, you realize that you are no longer a normal human being. That you are called. You are called. He has called you. You know it. Some of you know it. You can feel it. Like I feel it. You know it. You want to put on these things. And he will give you plenty of opportunity to try it out. To see if they do exist inside of you. Or at least begin to push off the anger and the doubts and the fears and put on the trust and the love and the tender mercies and the compassion on, on you. When somebody's mean to you, you don't have to be mean back. You don't have to be mean back. That's the natural thing to do when somebody's mean to you. The, the Christian thing to do is to take it. James was not fighting them off. Stephen was not fighting them off. Jesus on the cross was not fighting them off. He was letting them do it. He was letting them do it. Sometimes, if somebody wants to be mean to us, we just let them do it. And we just don't be mean back. We give love back. We give mercy back. We give tenderness back. That's what we do. That's what makes us different. That is what makes us Christian. To the world, it looks like weakness. To the world, it looks like weakness. That's why I believe the devil thought he could overtake the Lord himself in heaven. Because the Lord in heaven was tenderhearted and compassionate. And the devil thought that was a weakness. Guaranteed, he thought that was a weakness. That's why he said, I will raise my throne above the most high. I can take over over here because he's weak. Well, we know what happened to him. And we know what's going to happen to him. Then he says this, even as, oh, bearing one with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, go tell everybody. Is that what it says? No, no. It says, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you must also do. But above all these things, put on love you got to put these things on, which is the bond of perfection. They're not just going to come to you. You have to actively make it happen in your life. You have to actively walk these things out. It is not easy. It is not easy. It is not easy. I'm telling you, it's not easy. It's not easy. But it's possible. It is possible. That's the good thing. First Peter. Therefore... Laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. That's why we love to go verse by verse. That's why we love to use all these scriptures, because these scriptures and, and hearing it and, and, and reading it, it's like getting fed good vitamins. If indeed, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Have you tasted that the Lord is gracious? If you've tasted the Lord is gracious, why wouldn't you show grace? Fellowship. Christian fellowship. Doing things together. Serving the Lord together. Being a part of the family of God. Now, those, that's the baby boomers. <laughs> Loving together. Baptisms together. Doing life together. Father's sons together. Doing... Hurricane help together. 
loving each other, coming together as a team, coming together as a brotherhood, coming together as men, coming together praying. It's a brotherhood. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak, which is the weaknesses, their shortcomings. Remember? Bear them. They're weak. They're struggling. They don't walk like you walk. They don't come to church all the time like you come to church. They don't, they're not holy, holy, living like we are, but they still stumble. They still get involved in things, and instead of judging them, just pray for them. Love on them. Don't judge them. Love on them. And not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor. Now, who did Jesus say our neighbor was? He didn't. He said it's like the good Samaritan loving a guy he didn't even know. So there's no clear definition of a neighbor other than people. (laughs) Other than people. Whether you're rich people or poor people. They're all your neighbor. They're all. He put all of them on that list. Every human being is on that list when he says neighbor. For his good, leading to edification, building him up for his good, not my own good. For even Christ did not please himself, but as is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When me and Patricia moved back from Port Aransas, we moved down there in 99 to uh, pastor a church. We were asked to go down there and pastor this church. We went down there, lasted two years. While we were down there, we didn't have a place to live on the island because the island's very expensive to live. We had to bring in a mobile home and put it on there. Had to put it in our name. We were there for two years. The church, the only salary I got was the church made the payments on that mobile home. The only way we could get that mobile home was to put it in our name. We couldn't put it in the church's name. The church didn't have the money, the resources, so we had to put it in our name. So when we moved back, we left it with the other pastor. They ran into some problems, stopped making payments on that mobile home. They didn't call me. They didn't tell me until it was getting repossessed. Once they called me and told me it was getting repossessed and said, hey, just so you know, your mobile home's getting repossessed. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, they just haven't been able to make payments the last three or four months. I go, nobody called me. Well, we didn't have your number. I go, man, I'm in the phone book. I'm in the phone book. I remember going, I'm never going to be able to buy a house. Man, I'm, they burnt me. That church and the, and the, and the board and the, the elders of all that Pentecostal Church of God people and all those people, man, they burnt me. I was furious. I go, how could they do that to me? Who, what kind of Christians are those? Man, those are some good guys, I thought. I had a friend, an um, older man. In, um, for, he was from Lebanon originally. I did tile work for him for years. And um, when I, when I, he, he liked me because I was a Christian. He liked me when he heard I was starting a church. And... Um, He had a daughter who was a real estate lawyer, graduated from Baylor. So I went to him and said, hey, this is what happened to me, man. And um, I was hoping he'd let me hook up with his daughter and help me get a lawsuit and get all this taken care of. He'd let me just spill out my guts. I'm crying, just sharing about how I felt. And he goes, Albert, I'm going to pray for you. He said, but what does the word say? And I went, don't sue your brother. He said, you can't sue him. I went, you're right. You're right. Dang it. (laughs) I just remember going, oh, you got me, Lord. I said, but you know what? It is what it is. I'm going to trust you, Lord. And five years later, we decided to see if we could try to get a house and uh, so we put an application in they go hey we think we can help you we started the process but of course when you start doing that all the paperwork goes through whoever owned that note my name pops up call up 
hey, that guy still owes us $35,000 for that mobile home. I'm like, oh, man. They move us forward. We think we're getting this house. And uh, the owner of the house we liked, we found, was in our budget. He let us move in early before we did the signing date. And, man. Signing day kept getting pushed a week, another week, another week, another week. And, my na- and I lived next door to the guy I was buying the house from. And my wife called me up one day and said, crying. Because when we walked to the house, she said, oh, this is a perfect house. Thank God he's going to let us get a house after all. And I think the man just remodeled this house just for us. Everything is perfect in it. And then she called me up. Albert, they put a for sale sign back in the yard. And, and I just remember my heart sank, mostly for my wife. And uh, I was out of town and came back, and I said, stop nailing stuff on the walls. <laughs> stop putting things up. Let's just see how this plays out. And uh, I remember going to church one day, and the Lord had gave me a peace, and, and just gave me a peace. And just, he didn't tell me I was going to get the house. He just gave me a peace that I could trust him. Because that's the most important thing of this story. It had to get to a place where you trust him, no matter what happens. Trust him. And I go, Lord, just like Abraham trusted you with Isaac, Lord, I want to trust you like that. But I need my wife to get there. And I remember uh, one Sunday morning, we were there in our church. We were were on Franklin Avenue, you know, probably about 30, 40 of us. And we were sitting there, and I was holding her hand. We were worshiping in the song, um, He is God Alone, sits on the throne. And uh, I remember singing that song. I'm crying, and all of a sudden, my wife, she's worshiping, and she grabs my hand, she looks at me, and she said, I'm going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And as soon as she said that, I knew I was going to get that house. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. As soon as she got to that place where she gave up the house, God gave it, within a week, we closed on that house. Within a week, we closed on that house. We'd gone six weeks, not knowing what, but within a week, just getting to the place where we trusted his word, where we trust what he says, this is our hope. His word is our hope. This scripture right here, it's what guides us. It's what makes your marriage good. It's what makes a marriage last. It's what makes you a good example to your kids. It's what shakes the world, the devil, the darkness of this world is shaken. When you grab this book and you believe it and you trust it, get boy, like the Cowboys last night, boy, you just get down and go... Man, we win. We've won. We're winners. We're winners. We've already won. Don't let this world rob from you, but from doubt and fear. The two most powerful things that make people run, doubt and fear. Those things should make you run to this book, run to this word. Because these words are life. When you read it, it is life to us. And he will prove it over and over and over and over. And he has done that for me for 26 years. 26 years I've been walking with him. 24 years I've been married to Patricia. And he has strengthened our marriage, strengthened our relationship, our resolve. Even when our kids are all over the place, God has got us on a sure foundation. He is our rock. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you love us. Have mercy on us, Lord God. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your goodness. Father, we just ask you in Jesus' name, Lord God, to continue to get us to a place where we can walk in your character. Whatever it takes to get us there, Lord, Whatever we need to go through to get us to a place to trust you. Whatever it takes, Lord God, we pray that you move what you need to move to get us to that place. And Father, we thank you for loving us. We ask you to forgive us, Lord, where we fall short. Strengthen our resolve to trust you even more this coming year. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen.
If you're new here, you've only been coming a short while, we have a visitor's table back here. We have a gift for you, some information for you. We'd love for you to go over there and make contact with my sister Chrissy over there. Rest of you, God bless you. Hey, one more thing, one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. I don't know what time the Cowboys play, what day they play, but when you're here an hour before the game, we will be here eating and watching the game together. Just keep that in mind. God bless you guys. Have a good day.